It is a uh, really distinct honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Jason Furman. Uh, I think all of you have copies of uh, the bios of the speakers, so I'm not going to um, kind of list his titles and accomplishment. I'll simply say uh, two things. Uh, number one, he really is one of the finest public servants and public intellectuals, and, and that combination is extremely rare uh, of the last two decades uh, in terms of serving both in administrations and in think tanks and um, uh, kind of that interplay of ideas uh, and action. And I want to illustrate that with two things. First, uh, earlier on the panel, Mary Brown of Cisco said, uh, while the plan did a lot of very good things, probably the biggest thing it did in Spectrum was uh, she's never seen such a change in attitude uh, in the executive branch as what came out of the plan. Um, I really, really, really hate to correct Mary, because uh, I would really like to believe that was totally what John and Ruth and I and so many others uh, did on the plan. But the truth was, uh, it really was the work of people like Jason inside the uh, administration, talking, uh, making the economic case for why the administration had to care about Spectrum. It's very unusual for what uh, a speech that Jason's boss at the time, Larry Summers, gave very unusual for the president to uh, set a goal as the president did, but that was very much the work of uh, um, uh, people like Jason. And um, while I'm in the middle of confessing things, um, I also have to confess that over the last five years, one of the things that I've been most proud of saying is, yeah, I didn't exactly invent incentive auctions, but I was at the table where it was invented. Um, most people believe that. It's, that's also not true. Uh, <laughs> Somewhat sadly, in this case, the the but I but I was in the room when I when I think it was first revealed to the world, and that actually was in uh, an event. I think it was 2007, may have been early 2008, uh, at the Brookings Institute at a program put on by a uh, group called the Hamilton Project, where Phil Weiser, uh, dean of University of Colorado Law School, did a Spectrum paper, and uh, suggested kind of a framework that then later on we picked up on. Uh, in thinking about uh, spectrum auctions. Uh, the head of the Hamilton Project was Jason Furman. And I think putting on that conference, recognizing ideas, stimulating ideas, uh, advocating ideas, and turning those ideas uh, actually into action is a very, very rare thing. Uh, and with that, I am delighted to um, uh, introduce someone who deserves all the credit that, that people have been giving at various points in time, either John or Ruth or me or others, but a lot of that really does have to do with the great work that Jason has done uh, on broadband and the economy generally. So with that, let me turn it over to Jason. And we'll run till you're done. Uh, and if we have time for questions, we'll okay. do that. And if not, okay. no problem. Great. Uh, Blair, thanks for that um, introduction. Thanks for um, everything you've done on this. Um, you know, the, it's really appropriate. This is at the School of Continuing Education. Um, because this whole area um, has been an area of continuing education for me. And one of the ways I continue to educate myself is I carry the National Broadband Plan with me everywhere I go. <laughs> um, if you don't believe that, um, I have my copy, my copy right here with me. And if I forget my iPad, I have LTE on my cell phone. And it's a 6 plus, which is just large enough um, to let me read it too. And that's all you know, in part thanks to um, the National Broadband Plan. Um, Blair told the story about how I personally got involved in all of this. Um, it's running the Hamilton Project, and we were focused on America's growth. And I think Bob Rubin said, growth, that's infrastructure. Let's do a paper on infrastructure. And I think he thought I was going off to commission a paper on roads and bridges. He might have thought that I'd get creative and do something on sewers. Um, but instead, um, it was broadband, and it wasn't just any broadband, it was that sort of ethereal broadband um, going through the air. And we got uh, Phil Weiser and, and Pierre DeVries um, to do a great paper um, for us on incentive auctions. We had a great discussion about the paper um, with Blair. And, you know, I mean, sort of hooked me um, in terms of my own um, personal enthusiasm. Um, that enthusiasm um, was then reinforced by someone with a somewhat more forceful and direct style than Bob Rubin, um, Rahm Emanuel, 
in the first days of the transition, um, there were about four of us on the economic team. So Brian Deese was saving the auto industry. I was writing the Recovery Act, and I can't remember what the other two people were doing, but there was enough for them to do. Lee Sachs was stabilizing the financial system, that's right. Um, I can't remember who the fourth person was and what they were doing. Um, and we had put together some of the basics of the Recovery Act. We knew we were going to take the President's Health Information Technology Plan and put that in there. We were going to take his Energy Plan and put that in there. We were going to take his Education Plan, the front-loaded part of that, and put that in there. Um, but we hadn't um, planned on broadband. Um, because he hadn't actually had um, a spending initiative um, that related to broadband in, um, you know, in, in his campaign platform. And you know, in this case, as I said, um, it comes from Rom. Rom's a little bit more direct than Bob Rubin. And he called me and said, put a broadband plan into the Recovery Act. And I said, what? He said, put one in. I'm like, well, we have these other things. He's like, put one in. We're putting one in. I talked to Nancy Pelosi. She likes it. I like it. We're doing it. Put it in the plan. I'm like, okay, sounds good. We'll put it in the plan. Um, I didn't know exactly what it meant or what it meant um, to put it in the plan. Um, but fortunately, we had Julius, Blair, um, John, Anish, Larry Strickling, and 10 other equally important people who um, I apologize for neglecting to mention you, um, and basically said, you know, we're going to have a plan in here. It's going to be part of it. Um, let's put something in there. And out of that came um, BTOP. Out of that came um, what we did on the rural side to complement BTOP and Larry Strickling. I think this afternoon we'll be probably talking a lot about both of those, so I won't talk as much about them. Uh, but we knew that wasn't going to be the whole thing. And we knew an important part of the solution here wasn't going to be a government program that involves spending money. That's important um, as part of it to fill in um, some of the you know, different um, cracks in the system, especially in terms of rural areas, underserved areas, low-income households. But that a really big part of this um, had to be the private sector um, making the effort. And so, Unlike uh, you know, in the Recovery Act, I think we probably commissioned, I don't know how many reports. Um, I think I can confess that I've only read one of those reports. Um, there's only one of those reports that's having a conference five years later. Um, and I can't imagine that there's as many people as are in this room that's read you know, any of the others. And, this, and the reason was um, because we needed it. Um, as a country, we needed something that would tell us not just how to spend federal money, that's the least of it, but how to really catalyze um, the private sector and figure out how um, they could drive forward. There's um, a lot of elements of how the private sector can catalyze and drive forward. Part of it gets back to that infrastructure issue, the thing that started with um, the roads and bridges and um, making sure in particular that you had um, the spectrum infrastructure that you needed. And you know, the report set and the president um, adopted a goal of, of, 500, of um, 500 megahertz, um, freeing up 500 megahertz for mobile broadband, nearly doubling the amount of wireless spectrum. And then, um, you know, a year or so later after the broadband plan, um, I remember we were all sitting around in the Roosevelt Room, um, and I think Congress hadn't figured out how to pass whatever bills it needed to so that the President could go on his vacation in Hawaii and join his wife and children. So we were having lots more meetings with him than we usually had, um, which of course is a plus. Um, and, you know, he said, None of this is exciting me. Um, I want something more exciting than the policies that you're all bringing me. And at that time, Anish told him, why don't we set this goal of 98% of, um, of our country being, of people in our country being reached by wireless broadband. Uh, by, by, I'm sorry, by high speed um, wireless and by 4G. And so that was a goal um, we put into the State of the Union that to some degree draws on the ideas there. You know, a year later, um, the president's having um, you know, challenges getting through every single piece of what he wanted to get through um, Congress. Um, occasionally, they look at one of our ideas and decide not to pass it. 
And, um, you know, it was pressing us on what he can do that's big and meaningful um, administratively. And so, again, the National Broadband Plan um, had set out a number of different areas um, and placed a big emphasis on education. And that got the ball rolling on what eventually became um, to be ConnectEd. Um, that also had another goal underlying it, 99% of students, 95% um, of schools, I think, having access to next generation broadband by 2018. And that's another you know, really good example of the type of thing that you know, really does require a plan. Um, there's money required, and in this case, um, the FCC has the resources under its existing authority to do that money. Um, but there's also private commitments from companies that are needed. For it to work, we're going to need to make sure that we know how to do the training of the teachers, that we're developing um, the devices to use with it, we're developing the software. And, you know, in all of these things, the FCC is a part of that story, in fact, a very important part of that story, um, but can't be the only part. It has to be um, an administration-wide effort. I think if you look sort of day by day, um, you know, at this administration, five years later, I think we're doing as many things um, in this area as we were um, when the plan um, first initiated. You know, in addition to, you know, Connect Ed, one of the big challenges um, we're dealing with is, you know, we continue to have um, a big urban-rural divide um, in terms of broadband. We continue to have a lack of competition, um, especially at higher speeds. Um, the United States has made, you know, enormous strides in terms of the amount of private investment that's gone into this sector. And um, the internet service providers are among the biggest investors um, in the U.S. economy, and that's something that you know, we've helped facilitate with what we've done on Spectrum. It's something where tax policy, things like bonus depreciation, I think have also played an important role. Um, and it's something that has to do with the amount of innovation that's here um, you know, in the United States. But we're still, you know, despite all of that, um, have less competition than we'd like to have, and that shows up in you know, challenges in affordability. One of the places, not all of, you know, there's different policies that get at different aspects of that, um, but one of the ones that we've been focused on is in the area of municipal broadband and the types of laws and policies that limit um, local broadband infrastructure and what we can do um, to bring more competition in the 19 states um, that have those types of limitations. These are just a few of the you know, continued ongoing efforts um, that we're making in this area, and then you know, it'll continue on. Um, next year, the FCC has said it's going to be doing um, the incentive auctions, that idea that, you know, in some sense, sort of eight years from publication to execution is um, you know, a lot better than, for example, some of the tax reform ideas that many people have worked on, which are sort of getting towards infinity years from conception to um, execution. And, and um, staying on target um, with that 2016 um, timetable, I think, is very important to make sure that um, we're dealing with this um, really increasing amount of demand in this area. The success of the last auction, I think, is an argument for the importance of the next auction. If anything, um, you know, the prices per megahertz pop are higher than what we were modeling, and that should make um, the incentive auctions um, even more successful. So there's the things we're doing this year, the things we're doing next year, um, the things we're going to continue um, to do after that. Um, but I wanted to really um, lift up from a lot of the specifics that, you know, so many of you are so conversant with, um, to talk about how this fits in um, with the overall um, economic strategy. All of this, you know, for me, is about the most important thing that we're trying to accomplish in the economy, which is raising incomes for um, typical families, helping more families get in um, to the middle class. And there's a lot of different elements to that. And in the last um, economic report of the president, um, we analyzed three of those elements. 
One is the amount of productivity growth we have in an economy. The second is how the benefits of that productivity are shared, the degree of equality or inequality. Um, and the last is how many people are participating um, in the workforce, how many people you know, who want jobs are, are getting jobs. And one of the things that came out of our analysis, which is directly relevant for what we're talking about now, is how profoundly important um, productivity growth is for the incomes of the middle class. Um, from 1948 to 1973, um, productivity growth grew at 2.8 percent a year. Since 1973, it's grown at 1.8 percent per year. You know, why did it slow down when we have all these great innovations that everyone in this room is talking about? Um, well, part of it is a shift in the economy. A larger fraction of the economy is in areas like services and especially things like health that have less productivity growth. Um, this part of the economy is incredibly important, but it actually isn't um, where the majority of our GDP comes from. So when you take the productivity in the sector times its share of the economy, and then you weigh it in with things like education and health, which suffer from what economists call Baumol cost disease, where it's hard to get that much more output per unit of input. Um, you know, that helps explain you know, why you've seen this trend. Um, this trend has been you know, profoundly important. If productivity growth had continued at the rate in the 50s and 60s, then our incomes today would be 58% higher than they were. That would be an extra $30,000 for the typical family. That's even larger than the income gains than you would get if we hadn't seen the rise in inequality or the decline in the labor force um, participation rate. So this is a profoundly um, important source of incomes. And you know, to raise productivity, it's not going to be enough to have you know, the information technology sector become you know, much more product productive. Its productivity growth could go up to 40% a year, um, but when it's only a small fraction of the economy, it's still not going to translate. Um, where it is going to translate, though, is if it can help us overcome some of that Baumol cost disease that I was talking about and mean you can get more output per unit of input in areas like health and education, which are, um, you know, nearly a third of our economy. And if you can do that, then um, you can put ourselves, our country in a much better position um, to raise its productivity growth. And with higher productivity growth, um, there's still more things we need to do to make sure everyone shares in the benefit of that growth, that you're dealing with issues like um, inequality by making sure people have, for example, education and training to take advantage of the technology. Um, but you then have this high class problem of figuring out how to make sure that you know, of this more rapidly growing pie, um, a larger set of people um, can take advantage of it. And I think we're just at the beginning stages of seeing that. Um, the productivity boomlet we saw from 1995 to about 2005 was mostly in you know, the production of information technology and to some degree um, came to be the deployment. You know, what we're going to need to see next is that translating um, into gains throughout our economy. You know, it's something we observe um, with casual observation. If you just walk into a school or look at something like the smart grid um, in terms of energy or look at what's happening in, in health information technology, um, in the health sector, but we still haven't, I think, fully figured out um, how to take advantage of it. And you know, that's not going to be a self-executing process. It's one that the National Broadband Plan, those are all sectors it identified and had some ideas on. Um, it's places where we've tried with investments um, in health information technology, um, Connect Ed, but it's going to take a continued um, effort, both in terms of identifying you know, what some of the public policy obstacles are in those sectors, as well as um, you know, what are some of the uh, you know, private opportunities um, to make advancements. Um, you know, so I think in that sense, uh, you know, where I'd end is you know, broadband isn't going to you know, make us rich. Broadband isn't going to raise everyone's income, having more spectrum 
isn't going to mean you know our phones, let alone our economy, operates um, any better. Um, you know, it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. And it puts that infrastructure in place, and that infrastructure is incredibly important. Um, but you know, in some sense, the even harder thing is going to be to figure out how to even better use that infrastructure um, to transform uh, what we do. And you know, that's a challenge that's going to you know, continue to be with us in the years um, and decades to come. Um, and it's a challenge that we only have um, because we are um, doing such a good job on the infrastructure. And we're doing that good job in part because of the report and uh, all of you. So thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Jason set up, uh, we didn't actually coordinate this, but if you think about <laughs> it, uh, there are two big requirements. One is we got to get everybody on, which is the topic that we're going to handle in about five minutes. Okay. And then right after that, the topic is how do you have applications um, that really drive those productivity gains? And we're going to be talking mostly about healthcare and education. So, um, so we, we continue to be all coordinated. If you have time for I have time for like two questions, two and then questions unfortunately I need to rush your, back. Uh, any questions from uh, the audience that uh, anybody would like to ask? Uh, if not, we will let Jason get back to the work of making sure our economy continues to hum along <laughs> as it has been doing over the last few months. So join me again. In I will now bring back up uh, Larry Downs to introduce uh, John Horgan and the adoption panel. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, our, our next panel uh, reviews the efforts to improve adoption, as uh, Blair said, and utilization of broadband technologies, which covers uh, Chapter 9 of the National Broadband Plan for those of you who are keeping score at home. Uh, our introductory comments are going to come from John Horrigan, who is a senior researcher at the Pew Research Center, and he will be followed by comments from a distinguished panel, uh, which I will introduce after John gives his opening remarks. So uh, please, John, take it away. Thank you, Larry, and uh, thanks to everybody for coming out. It's great to see so many uh, familiar faces. Um, I do have a couple of slides. I don't know if they're teed up. If they're not anywhere to be found, it's not a big deal. Um, oh, I get to do that. Cool. Wonderful. Um, so what I want to do today is talk um, about three things in thinking about broadband adoption five years after the National Broadband Plan. First, reflect a little bit on where we were in addressing the issue five years ago. Second, talk about what we've learned since then, which is quite a bit. And then talk about what this means for the future. So the best way to sum up where we were on broadband adoption when we assembled five years ago to uh, tackle this issue was we were long on goals and aspirations, but short on proven models to guide policymakers. At the time, the Commerce Department's BTOP program was in its nascent stages and, and its impacts wouldn't be felt for several years. There were a handful of nonprofits that had been doing work in this space and we'll hear about some of that from uh, CFY in a little bit. But there wasn't um, really a plug and play model for policymakers to adapt to the national broadband plan. But since 2010, we have had overall progress in the home broadband adoption front that I think has been steady but not spectacular. And if you look at this slide, you can see, and this is according to Commerce Department statistics, the increase in broadband adoption from 63.5%, this is home broadband adoption subscriptions by households in 2009, up to 73% in 2013, the latest data that's available. And you see in particular the story is really still rather grim for low-income households. 
for households whose annual incomes are under $25,000 per year. We've seen from 2010 to the latest date in 2013 an increase in broadband adoption only from 43 percent, um, actually 42.9 percent, to 47.2 percent. Uh, um, so the news has been you know, okay in this arena, uh, but um, like I said, um, slow and steady. Now it's true that mobile access has had a huge impact on the access and usage space since then, but I think for reasons having to do with data caps on wireless access plans, especially for smartphones, a home broadband subscription does remain an anchor to people's online access experiences. And I think it does remain a very important metric for policymakers. But let's turn to what we've learned since then. Probably the biggest thing we learned about broadband adoption since 2010 is that it's a problem that's solvable, but perhaps not in the way that some people assumed a few years ago. We learned foremost that broadband adoption barriers are plural. When you look at the research, non-adopters typically cite two or three reasons as to why they don't have broadband at home, and those reasons sort into the um, buckets that are familiar to probably a lot of people in the room, costs, digital skills, and lack of relevance. But what this means is that focusing on one lever, say price of a monthly subscription, is not likely to move the dial much. Recent re research conducted by economists at the FCC and at Connected Nation using Connected Nation data shows that two-thirds of non-adopters said that they would not subscribe to broadband even if the price were zero. The key lesson here is that solving the broadband problem is not about devising the right price-based mechanism to change behavior. Rather, it's about building capacity at the local level, at, ins at institutions non-adopters trusts. The problem calls for drawing people into using broadband by showing them what the internet can do for them and give giving them the skills to trust it and use it. The phrase I use for this is promoting digital readiness not just among non-adopters, but recent or would-be internet users. So what does this uh, notion of digital readiness mean for models for the future? Well, we have seen models arise over the past several years that, that do offer guidance on how to promote digital readiness and get more people online. Some are for, from programs that BTOP has funded. The private sector has played a very key role here, too most prominently from Comcast's Internet Essentials program, but also Google's digital inclusion efforts in Google Fiber Cities. These different models add up to a general model of broadband adoption of use, and to me it's captured in three words, partnerships, engagement, and training. So yes, this is the pet model for promoting broadband adoption and use. Everybody loves their pets, um, and what I want to do is talk a little bit about each of these three elements to the pet model. I'll start with partnerships. Several years ago, NTIA sought to understand best practice in its BTOP-funded projects that focus on sustainable broadband adoption in public computing centers. The result from that effort was the Broadband Adoption Toolkit, which shows the importance of developing partnerships with established and trusted neighborhood institutions to promote adoption. We have in the audience Angela Seifer somewhere who did a lot of the heavy lifting on that project and Karen Hansen from NTIA who also did a lot of the work uh, underlying the broadband adoption toolkit. It's, the toolkit said that communities should develop a broadband adoption plan to, uh, to, to meet citizens' needs. Private sector partners are crucial to boosting public awareness of the program, offering training, and supplying discounted computers and home, uh, discounted uh, home internet connections. Partnerships, in other words, were indispensable to illuminating for people the value of having broadband access. Let's turn to engagement. That involves uh, the programs that you devise, meeting people where they are, which is a phrase invoked several times in the Broadband Adoption Toolkit. That is, these programs have to appeal to people to change their established routines that do not rely on internet access to get things done. This is a place-based strategy that calls for taking advantage of existing community institutions to promote digital engagement. Um, at the Pew Research Center, we've done a lot of work on libraries, and libraries are a great example of a trusted community institution to promote broadband adoption. 
and you can see from this slide that people see libraries as important for pro uh, providing programs for youth, providing access to computers, internet, and printers, helping people apply for government services, and helping people to find or apply for jobs. Low-income communities and communities of color are more likely than average to rely on libraries for um, internet and computer access than others. So libraries, again, are a key part of the engagement proposition as a trusted community institution. Another great example is the Comcast Internet, internet Essentials program, and we'll be hearing more about that. Internet Essentials aims at low-income families with children, and it provides um, an opportunity for people to get training on how to use computers, the chance to get a $150 computer for purchase, and a $10 per month access plan. Internet Essentials aims at something li likely to be very relevant to its uh, target population, their kids' education, and IE, by doing that, is clearly in addressing a need for its target population. Now, research I've done surveying Internet Essentials customers show that the service does help people meet expectations for connectivity. A report I did about a year, a year ago called The Essentials of Connectivity found that Internet Essentials households overwhelmingly say that their kids' school uh, expect them to have broadband at home. But was, what was also very important from that research is that the survey found that majorities say that other institutions, such as banks, such as healthcare providers, such as government, also expect them to have broadband access at home. These institutions are basically assuming the internet's relevance to users and that de delivery of services using digital means to these people will occur seamlessly. But that's a risky assumption. Inter the, um, essentials of connectivity research offers a different lesson. It shows that programmatic intervention can help overcome the relevance barrier for certain non-adopting groups and promote in digital engage engagement. Let me turn to the final part of the model, training. On its face, training is a bit of a no-brainer. If a key barrier to broadband adoption is dearth of skills with computers and the internet, then investing in training is a common sense strategy. But it's no sure bet that these investments will pay off. However, there's a growing body of evidence that does show and demonstrate that investments in training does pay off. I've done recent work on Internet Essentials, and yes, this portion of the talk is a research, uh, research presentation, um, on Comcast Internet Essentials called Deepening Ties. And what's interesting about this research is the research design. It's longitudinal research that interviewed Internet Essentials customers at two points in time, once in the early part of 2014 and a second time in September 2014. So that longitudinal design really enables you to track impacts over time. And to my knowledge, that hasn't been done in the space of broadband adoption before. And the research findings are striking. Those who had formal training on how to use the computer or the internet we're more likely to use the internet for a variety of purposes as displayed in this slide. More likely to use the internet to look for a job, stay in touch with family and friends, apply for a job, uh, work at home, or access government services. And those differences of um, as much as 15 percentage points are not only significant from a statistical perspective, but pretty substantial. So training really is drawing people more deeply into um, using the internet for these kinds of purposes. And the longitudinal design helps you to control for a whole lot of things you'd like to control for um, in, in trying to tease out these, these effects. Um, so what was the source of the training? In a phrase, trusted community institutions, libraries, community centers, and internet essentials training programs that are often run through community institutions. But the research shows that there's more to, to be done when it comes to training. The research found that one third, 31% of respondents had taken advantage of some sort of uh, formal training on the internet. So those people experiencing these positive impacts amount to one third of the sample. If we got more training resources out there, um, I think we could expect um, to see broader impacts in this, arena, in this arena. So looking to the future, what does the research I've talked about, but importantly, what 
does the body of uh, practice uh, that we've developed over the past several years say to stakeholders in the future? Two things. Best, basically, um, invest in expanding community capacity to help give life to the pet model of partnerships, engagement, and training. Secondly, expand the scope of stakeholders involved in addressing the problem. In the Internet Essentials research, I noted that uh, people say they face expectations from a whole variety of institutions that they have uh, connectivity at home. This reflects society's growing preference that people use the Internet for important um, uh, functions. To me, in turn, that means that more players, government agencies, banks, healthcare providers, have a growing stake in a connected and digitally ready population. So these institutions have a stake in trying to promote and implement and invest in this pet model. So five years ago, the goal was to close the digital divide and get broadband numbers up. Since then, we've learned that the challenge is tougher than we might expect, but also solvable. The elements in the PET model serve as a roadmap not just to get more people online, but to promote society-wide digital readiness. And with the emergence of the Internet of Things, along with people's abiding trust about privacy and trust online, there is going to be a need to get uh, tools into society to help people acclimate to the digital world. The current state of knowledge in the field shows, shows that there are viable models for continuing to, to develop these tools. As stakeholders and policymakers continue to look for ways to promote broadband adoption, and that could be at the community level, that could be in reform of the Lifeline program, they should look to the lessons learned over the past several years as a guidepost. So with that, I will conclude. We can let's get going on the panel. Great. Okay, thank you. And uh, thank you, John. I'd like to uh, invite my panelists up, please. And um, let me just briefly introduce them, but uh, refer you to the handout for their their details and very illustrious uh, biographic uh, bi biographies. Excuse me. Um, uh, immediately next to John, we have Brett Perkins, who's vice president of external and governor government affairs for Comcast. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Nicole Turner Lee, who's vice president, chief research and policy officer for the Multicultural Media Telecom and Internet Council. Um, and next to her is Mark Malaspina, who's the president of CFY. And then last but not least, Michael Scarato, the policy director at the National Hispanic Media Coalition. Welcome, everybody. Um, and Don, John, thank you for those insightful uh, comments. I want to uh, ask each of the uh, panelists, what I'm going to do is to sort of ask each of them a, a kind of a, a tee-up question uh, by way of response. And then I'll, I'll give you a last word before I come back to some, uh, some follow-up questions. Um, Brett, so I'm going to go in order here. Let me start with you. So the Internet Essentials programs, we, we just heard some of it. Um, and according to your most re recent progress report, has now signed up uh, 450,000 uh, low-income households to broadband services at reduced prices. Uh, tell us a little about how the program got started and what it is that uh, you've learned over the last, what has it been now? Four years. Four years. Okay. Four years. Yeah, great. Uh, I have to first thank you for the opportunity to be here and thank uh, John for the research and sort of teeing up the, the conversation. Uh, so I was a, a part of the, the team that uh, originally designed and then had the task of implementing the program about four years ago. Um, and as you, you mentioned, you know, we've now crossed over the threshold of 450,000 uh, families signed up, and it's about 1.8 million low-income Americans that have been impacted by the program. And um, since I know this is a bit of a retrospective on where we have come, if you think back four years ago when we were launching the program, we were in a bit of unchart uncharted territory. Um, there was really no one who had done something quite like what we had done. Uh, so um, we made lots of asks uh, to try to learn uh, quite a bit. And, now, and while it all may seem self-evident now four years later, um, when we were walking around and designing this, there was nothing that was really evident about exactly how we should do this. And I think we built into it a, a, a sense of uh, that we were going to have to learn as we go and treat it like we've called it, which is a very large experiment. Uh, and be iterative. 
Uh, and I think the National Broadband Plan helped provide a bit of framework uh, for those conversations. Up until that point, um, you know, we didn't have a lot that told us exactly where we should be focusing our efforts. I think it was incredibly helpful to have the plan come out and lay out, here are the barriers that you should be focusing on, here are um, how you should be prioritizing your time and your efforts. Uh, and so when we started the, the journey, um, we, we had a number of initial meetings, um, and Mark uh, Malaspina was actually one of them, and I, I got the chance to thank him recently because I remember the cold, snowy day we went up to Brooklyn and spent all day watching what CFY was doing and asking a million questions, and he was patient uh, with us as we were on our, our journey and our learning curve. Um, and then we got a chance to, to meet with folks from OATS and, and other uh, uh, programs um, that had been doing work like this. Stepping back for a second, we weren't new to this. Um, we had partnered with One Economy, we had partnered with LULAC, we had partnered with the Boys and Girls Club and Club Tech, and we had done work in this space. We just hadn't had the experience of trying to pull all these threads together to create a single program. So, you know, just for the what is Internet of Centrals? Internet of Centrals is a program that's targeted specifically at low-income families with children who are eligible um, to receive the National School Lunch Program. It was originally for the free school lunch, and then we've had a series of expansions uh, beyond that. And the purpose behind that was we learned from the research and the light that was shown from the National Broadband Plan that, as John said, it's not one thing. If you try to shoot at one thing, you will not move the needle. And so this was an attempt at trying to do the three big things, um, touching on relevance, so doing uh, digital literacy training, imprint online and in person, um, offering a um, lower cost uh, broadband uh, product for $9.95 a month and then the option to purchase a internet capable uh, computer for less than $150. And that, that is the offer that is the offer um, today. Uh, and so uh, from a lessons learned and um, how did it progress and then I'll, I'll hand off. Um, so uh, from the, from the get-go, we realized that there was a lot that would go into having to stand this up and create some perpetuity around it. We set up a call center that specifically handled phone calls for Internet Essentials customers. We created a partner portal that allowed our partners who were going to help us to order and we would ship to them free materials. Um, we created a website with um, digital literacy training uh, information on it. Uh, and, and then we ended up reaching out to literally thousands of schools and community partners. And I like the way that, that John framed this up um, because I, I couldn't say it better that partnership engagement and, and training have been um, key lessons learned and hallmarks for the, the program. Uh, I don't go anywhere and talk about the program without saying that the success of this is not a Comcast-only success. If you look at it at the ground level, if you go into any one of our communities, big and small, what you'll see are relationships between our team, local community organizations, schools, um, where we, uh, in some cases, are a convener, in some cases, we're a participant, uh, but with partners who are all focused on the same thing, um, but perhaps for different reasons. Uh, so if we're working with a school, you know, four years has changed a lot. You know, four years ago, we weren't talking quite as much about blended learning and having to have a computer at home. Now it is a must for schools. If you talk to healthcare uh, folks, same thing. It's important to have a computer uh, in your hands. So the big change for us really has been the amount of engagement that we've seen from those community and partners, uh, and there's no way that we could do this um, without them. I'll, I'll close just giving you a, a couple of, of stats, um, and they're in. I know we, we posted the, the latest brochure. Um, so through uh, February 2015, you know, we signed up, uh, connected more than 450,000 families. 
Um, and we have uh, provided nearly 38,000 subsidized computers that are less than $150 each. We've distributed more than 45 million um, Internet Essentials program materials um, through handing them out as well as through our partner uh, uh, portal. Uh, we broadcast more than 6 million public service announcements. Um, we've had over 3 million visitors to our Internet Essentials website. Um, so, uh, you know, this grew from something that was initially small that we weren't sure where it would go to a program now that has uh, real substance uh, and a significant commitment from our company, but probably more important from us, real engagement and partnership in the communities where we, we serve. Great. Okay. Um, thank you for that, Brett. Um, so let me turn to Nicole. So your organization uh, focuses not only on closing the digital divide, but also on promoting equal opportunity and civil rights for the broadband industries. What I'd like to know from you is what's happened in the last five years, and how do you think the National Broadband Plan influenced the pace, the trajectory, or neither, both, of improvements in broadband participation by minority communities? Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And John, good to see you uh, talk back about, talk about data. Um, and happy birthday to the National Broadband Plan. <laughs> For those of us that were very much involved with this process, prior to coming to the MMTC, I was at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, and we actually did the first National Broadband Adoption Study on minorities in particular that made it into the plan. And I give lots of thanks to Blair Levin who, and John, who took interest in what that uh, looked like for the communities that we served at the Joint Center. So now I'm in this space at MMTC where we're still talking about closing the digital divide. Um, and I appreciate all the comments that John has had and particularly how he's sort of reframed this conversation from digital divide to digital readiness, though he knows that I still think that the digital divide is still the priority um, obstacle that we have uh, when it comes to getting people online. I mean, face it, folks, there are still 30 million people that are not online. And so five years later, after the launch of the broadband plan, and I see Elise and other people, where actually the core focus of the national broadband plan was on people and particularly those people people that were underserved and underconnected um, at that time, we still have a long way to go. Um, so I wanted to share just in terms of this question that Larry asked about some of the progress that we've had and sort of share this comparison side by side of what we saw in 2010 and what we're seeing now. So when the broadband plan was released in 2010, the national data on home broadband adoption showed about 65% of Americans um, had home broadband access. And 35%, roughly about 80 million adults, did not have home access, and that was back in 2010. Latest data from Pew shows that home broadband adoption has increased by five points to 70%, and there's been some progress. When we published our study at the Joint Center back in 2010, African Americans and Latinos that were primarily higher income, uh, more educated, tend to have a higher trajectory of access and use compared to other populations. But interestingly enough, um, those percentage points have only increased since 2010 by five points for African Americans and four points for Hispanic Americans. So to some of us that might seem significant, but it is not. <laughs> because that means that we still have a large proportion of those people who are uh, tend to be low income, tend to be older, tend to be less educated, that sort of inflate that number and make it even larger in the larger sense of who constitutes the 28 to 30 million people that are not online. So given the fact that we're four years in and technology has remarkably changed, I think some of the questions that John put out in his, in his remarks really become relevant on how are we going to solve this digital divide, that digital divide that was talked about by NTIA years ago, right? It still is here, folks. It has has not gone away. Um, and the broadband plan, I think, addressed three primary areas, which I find to be interesting back then in comparing it now. The cost of services was clearly an obstacle, digital literacy and relevance. Uh, 2012, or study by NTIA based on 2012 data, actually put cost and relevance pretty close when it came to why people weren't adopting. And relevance continues to be one of those areas, particularly for African Americans and Hispanics, that are highly cited. Um, in 2012, 11, or some data that came after the broadband plan, there were still 40% of African Americans and 39% of Hispanics that still did not use the internet because they didn't think it was worthwhile. 
So if you place that question of people who are not using the internet because they don't think it's worthwhile against all the benefits that all of us in this room actually uh, bring to know that the internet actually provides, particularly for communities that could leverage the technology to solve social problems, we're just back in the space of, I think what John said, you know, giving us strategies on trying to figure out how to get more people online. And in particular, the people that we at MMTC are most concerned with and, and those in this room that follow the trajectory and pace of broadband adoption among low-income people, seniors, uh, people who are in rural areas, it becomes even harder to have this conversation as we see technology migrate for social use. So when you think about things like the Internet of Things and other new techno technological innovations that are going to create healthier and wealthier and more educated populations, there are still many people that are not benefiting. You know, universal broadband adoption and deployment is really a concern of, of creating the type of parity and democracy that we want to see in our society. And I think the broadband plan was sort of a mirror into like, how are we looking at ourselves on solving this problem, but yet the question has not really stayed in that space. It's gone to other regulatory conversations that have not addressed these kind of issues for us. Um, I want to just close, I think, by throwing out there, I think something on John's remarks that would be interesting in light of my comments. So, the fact that there is still a digital divide. You know, uh, I think framing the conversation around broadband demand, uh, some of the research that we've been looking at is some of the pieces has, what does demand look like then for people, right? How do you actually change the curve and the nature for getting people online? Um, I'm always intrigued by the numbers of African Americans and Latinos that use smart device, smartphones and mobile devices. Clearly, those are a game changer. I mean, the statistics in 2013 suggest that uh, three quarters of African Americans were cell phone owners compared to 68% of ha Hispanic Americans. That was more than white Americans. So that speaks to the value of that medium. The question that we all need to ask ourselves in the context of this conversation, are they using it to get jobs? Are we using it for uh, better health care outcomes? Are we using it to connect to family and friends to age in place? Or are we using it because it's just a popular place to be. And I blame, again, this question of demand, um, I think, on a couple of things, and I'll close there. You know, I think John is right that there has to be a combina combination <laughs> of this PET model, partnerships, engagement, and training, um, and combining those variables will actually help uh, people understand the demand and foster the demand. I, I was on a panel, actually, Debbie Berlin is here, where AARP talked about the way that they get seniors online is by getting other seniors to talk about it, right? And, and Brett, with the Internet Essentials Program, some of the success that is coming out of that program is because people in the community who are native to the community, not native to technology, actually bring others on board. I think that's one way to actually answer that debate. I think the other thing, and I'll throw this out just to be a little radical, because those of you who know me know that I tend to do that sometimes. I think there's also this question of looking at the adoption uh, question around the produ people as producers of the technology as well. Uh, I was on a panel the other day where I said that low, uh, minorities tend to over-index in their use of mobile, over-index in their use of social media, yet we've all been privy to the information that they are not decision makers in the boardrooms, nor do they have senior uh, suite positions, nor are they engaging in a meaningful way to sort of drive some of the purposes of how it could actually impact their communities. Might be a question on how you actually trigger this demand in such a way that it's much more meaningful for people and they move away from the consumption model more to the model of being actively engaged in solving the problem of the digital divide. Something to think about as we have this conversation further, but I'll, I'll stop there. But I think that, I think, uh, John, you did a really good job sort of encapsulating this issue, but I still think we have a lot more work to do when it comes to digital divide. Great. Okay. Well, thank you, Nicole. So, uh, Mark, let me turn to you. You lead a, a nonprofit organization, major national player in an effort to help low-income families adopt broadband. Can you share with us some of the lessons you've learned and particularly any recommendations you might have for national policy for the next five years? Thanks, Larry. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of CFY. Um, we're, as Larry said, a national education nonprofit. We were founded in 1999. And I wanted to share with you some insights that we have gained around broadband adoption, uh, particularly the role that schools with high numbers of low-income families can play in driving broadband adoption. So these remarks, I think, are going to be very consistent with John and Brett's comments, but really focusing on one particular 
uh, broadband partner, which are schools, and the findings that we've that we've had uh, about about the power of working with schools. So first, some background about CFY. We're not a broadband organization, we're an education organization. And our vision is that all students can have first-rate learning experiences regardless of their socioeconomic circumstances. To achieve this vision, we partner with schools in high, in high <coughs> poverty areas around the country to implement what we call people-centered digital learning. This means moving beyond the cramped notion of having students sitting in front of a computer with headphones working one-on-one -on -one with a computer. Rather, what we're focused on is creating vibrant, blended learning communities in which educators and families actively support students to leverage technology for learning across all settings, in the school, after school, at home, during school time, as well as during vacation. So really, the, the, the whole uh, environment for the student and the role that educators and families can play in supporting that. So what do we do exactly? For educators, we provide embedded coaching on implemented blending, blended learning in the classroom and for homework. For families, we provide hands-on training on uh, supporting their children in using digital learning. And we also provide them with free refurbished home computers, uh, which we call home learning centers, and information about any available broadband discount programs, such as Comcast Internet Essentials. Underlying our work is a platform called Power My Learning. It's a free platform that we've developed that has close to half a million registered users around the country and is designed to support personalized instruction and self-directed learning with all three constituents, students themselves, teachers, and parents. Our approach has proven positive impact on student achievement, teacher practice, and parent engagement. I didn't mention broadband adoption because that's not our primary focus. Our focus is on these other indicators, student achievement, teacher practice, and parent engagement. But what's very interesting, even though we're not a broadband program, is that our program has had a profound and positive impact on broadband adoption. Uh, we play key roles in successful BTOP adoption programs, uh, three of them actually. In New York City, we worked with schools to serve more than 27,000 families directly and had a broadband adoption rate of more than 86% among previously unsubscribed families. So what are the implications of our work for broadband adoption policy more generally? When people speak of the factors related to broadband adoption, they often focus on the concept of relevance. For instance, they talk about how to make broadband more obviously, quote, relevant to low-income families. In our experience, the term relevance needs to be replaced. We need to use the term motivation. The question is, what will really motivate families to adopt and sustain broadband? In our work, we have seen three key sources of motivation in the low-income parents with whom we work. First, these parents care deeply about their children's success in school and life. I cannot emphasize this point too strongly. Research by CFY and many other researchers have found that low-income parents deeply want their children to succeed, to go to college, to go to graduate school. This is a deep, deep motivation for low-income families. Secondly, these parents trust their children's schools and their children's teachers. And thirdly, these parents are motivated by the influence of their family peers within the school community. Based on these findings, what we found is that school-anchored programs that leverage these three key motivators can be highly effective in driving broadband adoption. Parents desperately want to know what role they can play in their children's academic and life success. And because schools and teachers are deeply trusted, they can be highly effective at getting families to understand the importance of digital learning and to getting the families to attend trainings around digital learning and digital citizen citizenship. We have more than 90% of families attending workshops in low-income schools. These are, these, are place, these are schools that typically have a, a hard time bringing families in, but when it's around something that the, the parents know that they will be armed to do something in the home, they're motivated to participate. Schools can also help families overcome instinctive distrust of broadband discount programs, so families don't just feel the broadband providers are out to fleece them somehow. This is, a, this is an important issue that I think needs to be wrestled with. And as their school then embraces the transformation to people-centered digital learning, families can see themselves as part of that transformation and are positively influenced by their peer family's own adoption of home broadband. 
So we're really excited about these findings. We think that it points the way to much broader work nationally around working with schools and low-income communities to really change the picture that, that's been described here and get many, many more low-income families online. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. That's very appreciated. Um, I want to bring you now into the, into the conversation. So as an advocate for Latinos in the broadband industries, what lessons do you think we can draw from the last five years? And more importantly, what can we do to improve uh, the track record for engagement for Latinos with broadband in the next five years? Great. Well, thank you, Larry. I mean, what a, what a great panel of experts. It's an honor to be invited to sit up here with all of you. Um, so I'm, I'm realize I'm sitting between folks and questions, and there's a big ticking clock in the back that's making. Well, we're, really... we're going to steal a few minutes from the next. <laughs> okay. So don't, 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 Good. Don't, so like... don't panic. <laughs> okay, I'll try not to. Um, so it's really great to be focusing on broadband adoption. I mean, broadband adoption, I would submit, is is kind of the primary broadband challenge that we're facing right now as a country, and and, and I say that, you know, for a few reasons. First of all. You know, we have, I think we have made pretty significant strides since the National Broadband Plan was written towards making sure that folks have access, so making sure that there's at least a wire or a wireless signal that crosses people's houses. Uh, adoption's been a little bit more tricky, as, as John so rightly uh, pointed out. And, you know, there's, there's some indication that that adoption's been slowing down a little bit in recent years. One of John's colleagues over at Pew uh, told the Senate Commerce Committee uh, about a year and ago, uh, about a year ago, that between 2000 and 2009, uh, broadband adoption increased by about seven percentage points a year. But then, between 2009 and 2013, total, uh, the increase over that course of time was seven percentage points. So, you know, some of that's to be expected as we're starting to get to the harder to reach folks, the the holdouts that that we're trying to, to get to. But that doesn't change the fact that you know having those folks disconnected is a, is a huge problem for all of us. Uh, this is also a really big issue because there's some new data that I've seen. Uh, there was a report by the National Agricultural and Rural Development Policy Center, which made some really interesting connections between broadband adoption in communities and economic outcomes in those communities. Um, they, what they found was that they, they went to, they did a kind of like a study of all non-metro uh, counties, and they looked at uh, a, a number of economic indicators in those counties between 2001 and 2010, including uh, broadband adoption. And, and what they found was that, you know, broadband adoption rates within those communities was a primary driver of positive economic outcomes. So in communities uh, that had 60 percent or more broadband adoption, uh, there was greater economic growth and, and less employment, particular, less unemployment, particularly around the time of the, the Great Recession towards the end of, of that time frame. Uh, communities that had 40 percent or less broadband adoption had lower growth in businesses and employees in their communities. So this gets to some of the economic outcomes that, that I think Jason uh, talked about during his keynote. And this demonstrates why getting, getting people online uh, is really important for all of us and for our communities. I mean, this all makes sense, and this was all contemplated in the National Broadband Plan. I mean, obviously, we know that having a broadband connection is crucial to accessing employment opportunities, you know, imp uh, improving educational outcomes, uh, improving the administration of, of social services, getting access to health care. You know, the list goes on and on, starting a small business. I mean, these are all outcomes that come from when folks get online. Uh, and beyond that, it's clear that, again, we all benefit when folks get online. You know, there's this idea of a network effect where each individual <laughs> user is actually creating value in the network for all of us. And, you know, this, this is kind of one of the primary linchpins behind this whole idea of universal service that, that we've embraced as this country for the better part of the last century. Um, getting more and more folks online, I mean, in the, in the Internet age, I think that's even more important. Uh, you know, as each person gets online, you know, not only are they somebody else that we can reach on the internet, but they're somebody else that's contributing to the internet. They're, they're contributing discourse, goods, and services that we can all take advantage of. So, you know, d despite many, uh, as I mentioned, despite many of the in interesting recommendations in the broadband plan, we're still, we're still lagging. Digital divide is still real, as so many before me have already mentioned. Um, Latinos, their adoption rate for Latinos, I've seen numbers between 50 and 60 percent. For Spanish speakers, it's close to around 38, 40 uh, percent for to ha have broadband at home, and you know that that just means that there's a lot of people that are being left behind right now. Um, one note on on some of the reasons for this, you know, uh, I I just want to make a plug for for not 
you know, minimizing the, 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 the cost factor in favor of relevance uh, and, you know, some of the other things that we've mentioned. Just for a few reasons. I mean, a lot of the numbers we have come from surveys, and, you know, I, I mean, John may or may not disagree with me on this, but, you know, you have to imagine that if, 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 some, if a lower-income person is getting surveyed on the phone from a stranger, they're, they're probably more likely to want to divulge if they can't afford something. You know, I don't know how that would skew the numbers, but, I, you know, I think that's a very real thing, and we've actually seen this in, in, in some of our work. We do a little bit of work with the California Emerging Technologies Fund uh, on adoption out in California. Um, the second thing to note, and, and I've heard Zach Leverins of, of the Everyone On group, which is a great group, say this in, in an event uh, a few months back, if you can't afford something, it's not necessarily relevant to you. So I think there's a lot of interplay between the, the, those two answers. Uh, and the third thing I'll say about cost is you might have noticed in, 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 in John's slide that the last two years, the lower, low income uh, adoption rate actually took a pretty slight dip. Um, the latest NTIA research shows that when folks get offline, at cost is the number one by far, by about 20 percentage points. About 40 percent of people who get offline cite the cost as a reason that they, that they had to give up that service. Um, quickly, we, we mentioned uh, mobile a bit. You know, mobile is a really interesting on-ramp. It's, it's great that, that people are getting online, but, you know, John and others have noted that there are some limitations. Uh, I want to touch on John's point about the, the, the usage caps, you know, just really briefly. Um, for the folks that could benefit the most from, from broadband, you know, mobile, again, is a great on-ramp, but it might be difficult for, for those folks to take advantage of some of the things that could really help them, distance learning opportunities, um, telehealth, you know, where you're talking about video conferencing with doctors, these high bandwidth things. There are certain uh, programs for folks with disabilities that are pretty high bandwidth. And, you know, that makes a home connection increasingly more important for making sure that folks can really fully engage and, and, and better their lives and, uh, through, through broadband. Um, quickly, specifically, uh, one of the recommendations of the National Broadband Plan was to make sure that a program called the Lifeline Program uh, was kind of modernized to better deal with the broadband age. Right now, the Lifeline Program provides a, a modest uh, subsidy, about $10 a month for uh, folks to, to get access to voice services and, and some limited broadband bundles. Um, something that we've really advocated for in, in, in recent years is making sure that that program really moves to fully supporting broadband. This program right now has demonstrated a, an ability to really reach the most disconnected among us. I mean, the, the people that are using this, this program and are getting, or, I mean, they're getting cell phones for the first time. Uh, you know, one one really large provider uh, released some numbers about their their the folks using their their program, and 50% of them, this was their their first wireless device, their first cell phone connection. Um, moreover, the people using the Lifeline program are precisely the groups that that are the hardest to reach when it comes to broadband adoption. We're talking about seniors, uh, you know, we're talking about lower income folks, the unemployed. Uh, struggling families, veterans, people with disabilities. These folks are being reached right now by the Lifeline program, and I think that there's tremendous potential should that program be fully modernized to broadband to, to get a lot more folks online in a really targeted way. Uh, and and just, I'll, I'll just note that there have been, there's some, been some indication out of the FCC that this process might be moving forward in, in, in the next uh, few months, hopefully. Um, Commissioner Clyburn gave a really great set of remarks at AEI back in November of last year where she talked about her vision for modernizing this program. Um, at the FCC's E-rate vote towards the end of last year, uh, a lot of folks touched on the idea of, of, of getting to Lifeline next and Chairman Wheeler actually noted that he thought he had th three votes for modernization of the program right then and there. And obviously the devil's in the details, there's a lot of work to be done to make sure, you know, how we can really let this program uh, you get to its full potential. but. Um, you know, that's one recommendation specifically, uh, a specific recommendation from the National Broadband Plan that I think has a lot of promise and, uh, you know, I'm looking forward to working on in the next few months. Great. Thank you. Actually, you, 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 uh, you guessed ahead one of my follow-up questions, so, so thank you. I wanted to ask about Lifeline. Um, uh, I, I want to give John an opportunity to respond but in the interest of time. What I think I'll do is I'm going to ask him to respond in the form of a follow-up question, and then after John, I want to ask anybody else who wants to chime in here. So. Um, we, we talked about the, the relevance, or as Mark says, the, the motivation issue. That, of course, seems to come up persistently in the Pew surveys. Um, let's talk a little about, about uh, training, uh, and, uh, and particularly I'm thinking about, again, in the surveys, um, 
that we have, I wouldn't even, I don't know, I would call it digital divide so much as digital divides, uh, because we do have all these other, you know, the, I think one of the surprising things I always find in looking at the results is uh, the persistent issue of, of uh, older Americans, rural Americans, uh, Americans who, for whom English is not their first language, uh, that, uh, that these seem to be even more prominent a, as issues. So in thinking about the pet model that you laid out, John, how, how, does, how different does the, the training part of that have to be for specific communities, or in fact, uh, can, we, can we solve it with one, uh, you know, one fell swoop? I mean, I think you need to make the training relevant or motivational for specific target populations. So, um, I mean, Mark's point was great about we don't provide internet training, we provide people training on how to solve some problems in their lives or address some issues in their lives, and the context for Mark is education. That may, <coughs> the context for an older American might be different, so you tailor the, the training to those particular kinds of populations. But you have to be, and that's why the PET model is really a continuum as opposed to some sort of sequence. You're gonna tailor your training to, uh, in such a way that it engages or motivates the target population to use, um, to use the technology, at which point um, price probably starts to become a relevant lever to think about, but until you do those other things, I think people are gonna um, not understand the, the, what the price proposition really means to them because the stuff isn't uh, relevant <coughs> to them until you address those other parts of it. Okay, let's go, we might as well go down unless anybody wants to pass, but. You, you know, I mean, I've got a, I mean, great example early on. I mean, when we structured the training for Internet Centrals from the get-go, uh, we had a very, out of the box, we wanted everyone to do it exactly the same because we wanted to be able to look, measure, uh, and after we went through our initial uh, launch, we got feedback. I, someone pulled me by the collar, one of our partners, it was here in Washington and they were some, from someplace else, and they said, hey, love being a partner, I think this is really get great, I hope you don't mind, but we've changed the training that you sent to us. So of course I, I looked <laughs> as if I could do anything at that point, and I said, well, why don't you describe that to me? Uh, and this person said, well, you said you wanted to do digital literacy training. Uh, and the first time I talked to somebody about that, they just stared at me and they didn't know what it was. Uh, and so he said, what we did was we changed it and we said, come find a job on the internet um, to get, as he said, butts in the seat. And then when they got in the seat, then they went through and did the other pieces of it. But it went to the relevance of, we have this language, um, how we talk about this. In the end, for someone who hasn't used this technology, doesn't think about it, you've got to find some way to grab their attention. Uh, and then one other point, and then I'll, I'll pass the mic. Um, I, this, this area is the area where everybody should have skin in the game. So I know we're an ISP, a lot of focus on ISPs and the role that we can play and the government and there are certain not-for-profits that have stepped up, but literally everybody should have skin in this game because you don't have to be an ISP to have an impact here. We have brilliant folks who do lots of things with apps and online programming that can play a role in this space by designing things to bring people online. If you're a government agency, you have the ability to aggregate demand to bring people online. If you're a school district, it literally is everybody. So I think as we talk about this, um, part of the challenge is for anyone who's sitting in the audience that I always put is, so what are you gonna do about this? I've got skin in the game, but what are you gonna do about it in your own little way to make a difference? Great. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and I'll be, I'll be brief. I think um, the comments so far are correct. I mean, digital literacy in the box was like the model that we all use. I mean, I remember Microsoft Office was the first level of training that we wanted people to have, and then it became Learn Internet Explorer. And I think digital literacy training has even, since the broadband plan, has taken on a different dynamic, right? Before it was, we need people to understand the value of broadband. And I, I would suggest, I think, we actually need to disentangle this by three areas, right? One is there's always going to need, be a need for structured targeted training 
uh, for people where English is a second language, for older Americans, for uh, communities where it may be serving a different purpose. You know, targeting uh, training for that purpose, I think, is still going to be key. But I think what we're also hearing from Mark, there should be training that's integrated into the different verticals, where we're not teaching it because we want you to use it as an educator. But you know, we're seeing that now when young people get iPads, they're not teaching them iPad training. They're saying, start doing your homework on this iPad. It's really you training know. on what not, what not to use. Exactly. Yeah. But then I think there's this third point, which I've been really curious about, which is intuitive training, right? It's, it, you know, we always talk about millennials have adopted this so quickly. Well, part of it's because it's so intuitive. They don't know what else to do. Those of us that are in this place, I'm not going to say my age, and I don't want you to share yours, right? There were just other ways that we did things, right? Before there was e-commerce, we went to a store and we bought things, and there are some of us still stuck in those ways. And I think we need to look at digital literacy training for the intuitive nature. That's where we're going to see, and I think Blair used to say this years ago, I won't repeat the analogy he used to use, but at some point, it will become so intuitive that people won't have other means of using it that you'll want to step up and actually learn it because you have no other choice. So I I think there's another, I don't, I don't know how you actually deal with that part, and I think the conversation on the intuitive side has been more structured around privacy um, as opposed to more comprehensive and, you know, how do we allow people to see literacy as just things that we do now that are more habit than they are, you know, um, optional. Thank you. Mark? Yeah, I just wanted to say one more word about the distinctions in training. We're, we're very <laughs> friendly with OATS, which is a great organization that works with seniors, and I've been having lots of conversations with uh, Tom Camber about the differences between their training models and our training models. Mm -hmm. And one of the really interesting things, I think, is that working with seniors who have real needs around kind of core digital skills, whereas with us, we view the, the children themselves as, as kind of part of the tech support and training arm of, of our organization. So they're, they're actually, um, you know, both in the workshops themselves and as follow-up, they're, they're actually taking the lead on getting families kind of conversant with um, some of the key technical issues. And then the, the, our work with families is focused on things like digital citizenship, the, the what not to do or the how to kind of supervise the, the work uh, of, of the children, how to interface with the school most effectively. And I think thinking about the different training models and really um, differentiating them as much as possible I think is really important. Great, thank you. Michael, do you want to add anything? Yeah, just real quick. I mean, so the, when I think about relevancy and training, I, I think about it a, a lot actually. And, and when, what I get back to is it's a really, it's a personal thing for a lot of different folks when to, to try to figure out what kind of training would impact them or what type of exposure would impact them. But we all make decisions to adopt or not to adopt technologies or services in our own lives. And ultimately, at least in my, for me, it would it, it ultimately comes down to exposure. And and I think there's there, a lot of times what uh, is really important is ma just making sure that people are exposed even at a very basic level to to a to something like the internet so that they can figure out what the, what what's going to be the killer app that ultimately gets gets them to adopt but you know i mean thinking about it in terms of your own personal experience i mean, I mean for me you know uh, i don't know if the apple watch is relevant to me because i don't know i don't think i can afford it <laughs> on my public interest salary but I'm sure when I'm exposed to one, I'm going to be uh, pretty interested in, in, in getting it. And I think just that very basic exposure and then, you know, seeing what's relevant to you when, when you see a new service or technology applies uh, equally to, to this broadband space. Okay. John, I'll let you have the last word on this, and I want to see if, uh, if you have a question from the audience, uh, please raise your hand. Okay. Um, we'll send a mic over but, and another one here. Go ahead, John. My quick observation, we've been talking a lot about training, which is, I think, exactly what we should be talking about. I think for policymakers going forward, particularly as they think about Lifeline, is, is Lifeline going to provide training? And I don't know the answer to that, but I don't think Lifeline reform without thinking very consciously about this training element is going to be as successful as some people hope. Okay, thanks. Um, let's take a couple yeah. questions from the audience. I have one here and I have one here. I'll go first. Uh, Kerry Hinton with the DC Public Service Commission. I wanted to ask Brett in particular and any of the other panelists to comment as to whether Comcast Internet Essentials or the other ILEC programs that have been run by uh, CenturyLink and by Frontier and the various uh, uh, test 
projects that were funded by the FCC and also funded by NTIA through the uh, BTOP program, whether any of those are scalable on a national basis to serve as a model to the FCC for uh, creating a broadband lifeline program. Thank you for that question. Go ahead, Brett. Um, so, I mean, we, look, I think we, we took the perspective that Internet Essentials from Comcast had to be scalable and we weren't going to implement it in one market and not another market. But as a single company doing this program is a significant undertaking when you think about all of the pieces together, uh, that it's not just providing the internet service, but it's also then subsidizing a computer and, and partnering and paying for, for training. I think what we see is that underneath that model, it's, it's worked. Um, it's been a lot of effort coordinating it, but it's it's worked. I think, yeah, and I won't speak for the FCC or the NTIA on what they've they've garnered from from their work, but I know that there's more capacity out there than there was four years ago. Um, so you know, the great example is when I would walk into a room four years ago, I'd have a conversation, and I got a lot of strange looks, and it took a while to get people going. You know, two years ago, I was walking into a room, and there's a whole conversation with a bunch of stakeholders who were very focused. On, on this issue who are running their own programs um, and, and trying to scale them. So I think we've got a lot more that, that is out there, and a lot of that has uh, been through the work of um, the NTIA um, in setting these things up. I, 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 don't, I wouldn't look at it and say Comcast our program has to be the one everybody does. I do think what we, we need to look at is what are the other kinds of programs that can buttress that um, and play a role in this. Yeah, can, okay. I, can I just, yeah, real quick, just quickly on that too? I mean, I think uh, we're waiting also, I mean, to see about the lifeline broadband pilots at the FCC in particular. I just actually inquired as to where those are because I think they were going to show us, you know, the means testing on, you know, the price sensitivities and the adoption rates, et cetera. But I, I, I kind of want to say like this, um, because we at MMTC are also looking at um, Lifeline and the adoption of mobile um, broadband to the Lifeline program. You know, part of it is the policy shift will obviously create the conditions and the criteria to do um, the um, uh, addition of uh, broadband in addition to voice, for example, to Lifeline. But I think the thing that you're hearing from this panel is it's going to take a lot more components to get to the level of scale. I mean, what Comcast did did not require just Comcast, but there was also interagency coordination by going to kids that are eligible for the school lunch program. That's gonna be the same thing with Lifeline. I mean, we, we um, actually have been very um, encouraged by Congressman Boucher's um, at work on looking, and the IIA, and looking at how do you make the program much more functional, much more seamless for consumers, much more easier for companies, for eligibility requirements as well. But I think the kicker is, it's, you know, I think M Michael kind of said it, Access is one key to this whole solving the adoption problem, but it's actually going to be looking at the entire ecosystem and how the actors all line up to make it successful to solve the adoption problem. Because you can get a lot of people online, but it does not necessarily mean they're going to use it for community benefit, and it doesn't mean at what point and what stage you're going to enter the internet, and that's where the problem of scale, having been at one economy and done a lot of programs across the country, they're so hard to scale if there's not the imperative of broadband from a national policy perspective to make this you know, something that we all want to happen together. Great, thanks. Um, another question, thank you. On that note, similarly, um, what role does government really play uh, in bridging the digital divide? And in particular, is this an issue, I know we're talking about this at the federal level, looking at the national broadband plan, but what role do states and municipalities also have to play? And um, I particularly would like to hear from everyone, but. Brett, um, as well as Mark, who's worked on these issues. Thank you. Mark, you want to go first? Uh, I'll, I'll defer to Brett on this one. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <clears throat> I mean, I'll go back to my uh, earlier comment about um, if you, you think about this from a, a priority, have a conversation, you say, anyone in government, and ask the question, why does it matter? Um, and you have to start there, that there are outcomes that we want from this. And it was our outcomes that were articulated back with the National Broadband Plan. That hasn't changed, right? But we're much closer to those things actually coming to fruition. So I'm a former healthcare person. I worked on telemedicine over a decade ago. 
and we were using dial-up service to test the efficacy of doing home health care uh, visits with congestive heart failure patients. The idea was there. The technology arguably was there because we proved it worked, but what we didn't have was the right, the right focus from the policy side to say, hey, we want to make this happen. So I do think that part of it is asking the question, you know, what do you want from an outcome? perspective. I hear a lot now, I spend a lot of time in cities, uh, and you can go down the list of city agencies, and I've, and I've heard enlightened mayors talk about this, that each one of those city agencies has to have a technology plan to it. I heard Mayor Garcetti from LA talk about this this past weekend, uh, and say that if we're talking about economic development, what is your technology plan? And the city has a big role in helping to drive economic development and linking in technology. If we're talking about education, you know, what is your technology plan for that? We're going to go to a blended learning. We're going to do digital textbooks. Well, how are you going to, to get there? At the strategy level, you know, the government plays a, a role in, in helping to shape, um, you know, these forces to come together to drive a policy outcome. Right. I'm going to let John have the last word here, and then we're going to have to unfortunately draw to a close. I think in the past four years, we've seen lots of activity on this issue at the state and local level that is partly driven by the recommendations in the national broadband plan. So I think that is one of the reasons Brett could go into a room two years ago and have a very different conversation than he could four years ago. The federal government has, because of budgetary constraints, kind of taken a step back. I think as there are greater expectations for service delivery by state agencies, local agencies, federal agencies. It's time to re-engage more widely the government with uh, trying to solve this problem along the lines that um, I think we've all touched on today. Okay. Well, we, unfortunately, we've got a lot more. To, I've got another dozen questions here. But uh, in the interest of uh, time, and I apologize for putting us a little behind schedule, but uh, we had such a, a great lineup, I, I, I wanted to do that to, to, uh, to Blair. Um, so let me ask you to thank the, the panel here, and uh, we'll uh, turn over to the next group. Thank you. Um, and uh, this is a good segue because, of course, I think one of the things that will continue to, to drive relevance, or as Mark says, motivation, is um, more compelling applications, and that's the topic of our very next panel. Uh, yes, I'm going to going um, because we do want to be seamless in this and um, uh, really appreciate people sticking around uh, for this um, because I think this actually turns out to be um, kind of where the next um, uh, the, the next efforts really need to be um, and as the last panelists were all talking about it's really about how we use the stuff um, and that's what fundamentally matters um, and we, about half of the plan, and this was also somewhat unusual for uh, broadband plans, uh, most of which in other countries focused on networks. Uh, in this one, we were really focusing on um, not just the networks, but also getting folks on, and uh, as well as uses. Um, a lot has been done. I think, uh, as you'll see in this next panel, there's a lot more to be done, but there are certain barriers. So what I'm going to do is quickly uh, read the notes that Nick Sinai gave me, and then we will um, have a discussion with some of the folks who uh, both helped with the drafting of uh, certain parts of the plan, as well as folks who are working in these areas about how do we use the how do we use this platform better um, uh, for the uh, for the users. Um, Nick uh, came to us from uh, a private equity group and then uh, wrote the energy uh, section of the plan, um, then went to the Office of Science and Technology um, uh, office where he actually uh, implemented uh, some of his ideas as well as the ideas of others. I'm going to start with energy where we now have over 60 million smart meters uh, installed and we're starting to see examples of where grid sensors are making uh, the grid more reliable. Uh, the big question is how to make use of the data. Uh, one of the ideas he had in the plan and then was able to implement was something called the Green Button Initiative, which was allowing energy consumers to have access to their data. Uh, it now has over 60 utilities participating, and there was a significant amount of uh, controversy over who actually owns the data, whether it's the utility or the consumer. Um, uh, but Nick was able to work through that. 
and now about 100 million Americans, about a third of America, can get standard access to their household energy data for use with, for example, solar calculators, energy efficiency um, uh, competitions, and more sophisticated software for commercial buildings, uh, for purposes of retrofitting or operational savings. You now have companies like Nest and um, Opware, prime examples of um, uh, reimagining the consumer experience. But you could also consider a similar kind of thing about use of data uh, when you look at things like Uber or Lyft or uh, using mobile to disrupt transportation um, with autonomous vehicles uh, on the horizon. And Nick suggested people look up the company Vinli, that's V-I-N-L-I, as a platform for building consumer uh, applications from your car's data. Um, so that's on the energy side, on the public safety side. Uh, the idea of a national um, um, uh, public safety network, which uh, Dean talked about earlier. Of course, the legislation was passed on that. Uh, the country is in the process of building that out. Uh, but as he suggested, it's slow going. And that's something that I think a lot more work will need to be done, not just in the next couple of years, but over the next five to 10 years. Um, in education, uh, there's been some discussion already uh, about uh, the E-rate reforms, which uh, certainly were part of it, but it wasn't the only thing. Um, the administration had um, launched Connected Ed because it's not simply about getting the networks in and um, uh, uh, the, 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 certainly the networks were a big piece of it. And uh, I would note that Nick had a point, which I agree with, which was that a personal and adopted uh, learning is already upon us. Um, and arguably, we should have focused more on the infrastructure issues for the schools and the National Broadband Plan. Uh, we did a little bit of that, but I was, uh, it's great that the FCC took that and went well beyond um, uh, what we were doing in terms of both budget questions um, uh, as well as some others. Uh, but still a bunch to be done. And then in healthcare, obviously, uh, it was a big piece. It started well before the plan, as Jason was talking about earlier with electronic medical records. Um, uh, certainly, the Recovery Act gave a lift to that, but there's still a lot of work to do to make them interoperable uh, and accessible and useful to patients and their apps. Uh, there is um, some rules on meaningful use that still need to be done, and we uh, actually some of that may come out soon. The rise of wearables and well-funded digital health startup companies is a promising sign that entrepreneurs as well as um, large companies like Apple are trying to disrupt the system. And uh, we certainly see some, some progress there. But again, um, uh, a fair amount to be done. Um, something we did not discuss uh, much in the plan, but uh, as Nick got to OSTP, and I think the administration deserves some credit for this, though I certainly see this as kind of a bipartisan thing, um, uh, though one could also say it started really with the blow up of healthcare.gov. Um, that certainly focused the attention of various people inside the federal government on how governments, particularly the federal government, buys IT. So we needed a smarter IT strategy. Um, and there's progress being made uh, in reforming the $80 billion of annual federal government expenditure. Um, there's now a US data service with about 30 people in the White House. There's also a really interesting group that is referred to as Unit 18F, Jim, you, you, I, I, I keep forgetting the derivation. Maybe you'll explain that to us when you're up here. But it's fundamentally to try to get what you might think of as a SWAT team of uh, really smart, high-tech folks um, uh, who can move between agencies instead of being simply assigned to an agency which cannot recruit the kind of talent we really, the federal government really needs. You have a mobile team of folks who are very adept uh, at doing these kinds of things. Um, so that was, uh, they have about 100 people, uh, including Presidential Innovation uh, Fellows, um, which are now being uh, embedded in various different agencies. And they're doing all kinds of uh, different things, uh, or working with various applications, how to make data uh, more accessible, more user-friendly, relaunch data.gov, which now has over 100,000 data sets. Uh, there was a 2013 executive order to make open a machine-readable uh, machine data the new default, um, and really is focusing on kind of a demand-driven strategy that has a number of components, 
including the appointment of the first chief data scientist uh, who was uh, uh, just appointed. A big issue uh, is the issue of use of data um, because with the use of data comes issues of privacy and responsible data use and cyber, uh, cyber security. The White House Big Data Report helped illustrate some of the opportunities but also the challenges. Uh, there could be inadvertent discrimination, there can be leakage, there's all kinds of different uh, privacy concerns. At the end of the day, Nick wanted me to emphasize that this really should be driven by the question of what is the user need as opposed to designing by stakeholder input. And also, there is a motto that the strategy is the delivery, that ideas are not in short supply, uh, but doers are. And that um, uh, relates to the final point Nick wanted me to say, which is the solution to any tough policy question will likely include uh, good people who are working on it, meaningful transparency about how they're working on it, and w them working in an institution that owns and is accountable for solving uh, the problem. So that's a matter of open comments. Let me get Carrie and Jim and John up here. Um, uh, and as noted before, uh, um, I don't really do formal introductions, um, but I'll just talk a little bit about the people. Carrie uh, joined our uh, broadband uh, plan team and worked with several others on the uh, health care uh, section uh, and is working on these issues still here uh, in terms of interoperability. I'll have her describe that uh, in a minute. Uh, John has a long career of working uh, as an edu in the education area, including as the education advisor to uh, Jeb Bush, uh, but working with uh, states all around the country in trying to uh, bring these um, tools to bear uh, uh, and improve education in a variety of different ways. The number of jobs Jim has had in the number of different sectors um, he has worked on uh, is incalculable. <coughs> Jim and I first worked together back during the era of the Clinton administration uh, in the early days of, um, of the internet, including the early days of the E-rate. Uh, and have shared many, many war stories uh, with, with lots of incoming. Uh, but Jim, like myself, also came back to this administration, worked, uh, unlike me, worked in the Office of Science and Technology Policy, worked on the education side, the healthcare side, the rocket scientist side, and a thousand other uh, things, um, uh, and uh, uh, knows this area uh, extremely well. Carrie, I want to start with you because, uh, you know, when we were writing the healthcare part, one of the biggest problems we were talking about, even then, was interoperability of data as a necessary foundation for improving healthcare uh, service delivery. Your current work is focused on that. Can you, can you tell us about how it's going, but also from a policy perspective, how do we really open it up so that it can do, uh, we, 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 we've been talking about, uh, and, and Jason was talking about how do we really use this data to improve people's lives. Right. How do we do that? All right, well, easy question. Thank you, Blair. Um, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for sticking with us today. It's exciting to be back. Um, so interoperability, the concept just rolls off your tongue. You know, what do we mean when we're talking about that, first of all? One of the big challenges is defining it. And once you define it, you have to measure it. So we're talking about, in the healthcare context, the ability of medical technologies to communicate with each other. And um, I think we'll find one of my key gripes about how we discuss this as a country is we immediately start talking only about electronic health records. And they are a very important part of the system, but not the only part of the scope. You know, there's a big focus on medical devices and having those devices talk not only directly to each other, but with the electronic health record um, that needs to be considered um, and I think talked about. So how are we doing on interoperability? Uh, not well, to be honest. Um, there are pockets of success around the country, but it's very limited, and we are not scaling this nationally as we need to. Uh, there's no shortage of challenges, and honestly, no shortage of folks who are working on the problem. Let me just say a, a tiny bit about uh, my organization is the Center for Medical Interoperability. It's a new nonprofit organization led by hospital and health system executives to work on their shared technical challenges 
in getting medical technologies to integrate in a plug and play manner. For those of you familiar with the cable labs, that's sort of what we're emulating. So it's bringing to the healthcare vertical a shared technical resource, an actual lab where they can work on these challenges together that otherwise the industry is too fragmented to tackle alone. So we'll keep you posted on our progress. But um, on the policy side, you know, we always come back to the incentives in healthcare highly misaligned. Um, and uh, you know, we wrote about that in the plan five years ago. We continue to make progress al around aligning our system around value, uh, but it's a, you know, it's a marathon, not a sprint. And when you think about how do you get to value, you know, value is some combination of cost and quality, and value is determined at an individual level. So value to whom, and who's to say what the appropriate value is. When I think about the buckets that are going to drive value, I promise I'm going to give you guys a turn today, don't mm -hmm. worry. <laughs> um, you know, there's these big buckets around data sharing, care coordination, consumer engagement, and analytics. Um, so I think we really need to focus on those. And um, I guess my one policy thing related still to the National Broadband Plan is let's continue to make sure that we have affordable infrastructure available, both wired and wireless, especially in the rural and underserved areas, because the lag exists. Yeah, and I would just note yesterday um, at the uh, event on just anchor institutions, it was pointed out that of the $400 million rural health care fund, mm -hmm. only 170 has been has gotten out the door, um, not because of lack of demand, but because of various difficulties in, in either applying for it or getting it out the door right. or something like that. So, um, and there's always a problem, one should be sympathetic. Uh, this was a problem that our uh, Larry Strickling had with the BTOP program. You wanna make sure that the money is gonna be used well, but in order to do that, you put certain, de you know, certain demands on the people who are asking for the funding. And that's, yeah. that's kind of something where you're always constantly trying to thread the needle correctly. John, I wanna move to you. Um, Education reform is always popular until we get into the details, and we've seen how some efforts have been chewed up by political backlash, most prominently Common Core, but for our purposes today, maybe more important, in bloom, and for those of you who don't know it, it was a Gates Foundation-funded effort, uh, received a huge amount of money uh, that aimed to store, um, clean, and aggregate a wide range of student information for states and districts, make that data available to district approved third party to develop tools and dashboards so the data could be more easily used by classroom educators. Um, uh, it seemed like a really good idea, got a lot of support. Well, there was actually a broadband plan alumni who was the chief technology officer. And then there was a huge parent backlash about over concerns about privacy and it folded. Uh, I don't wanna focus on them specifically, but w what are the big opportunities ahead and how do we get through that barrier of concern about uh, student privacy. Great, thanks. It's um, yeah, the student the student data privacy. I mean, it's if you want a sense of where education is headed, look at uh, healthcare today, um, because I, I think the two sectors are sort of arguably like very similar. You have large sort of fragmented, you know, systems, misaligned incentives. Um, you know, our Title One is very similar to sort of Medicare, and then also. You know, we're seeing as a result of um, broadband, as a result of technology, sort of this proliferation of records. Yeah, but the problem is that there's not sort of one central student record. But if you walk into a classroom today, it's not unusual to find a teacher with an online grade book, uh, with several pieces of online curriculum, some of them personalized, some of them not, uh, maybe using tablets with lots of different apps. Every one of those systems creates a separate record and none of them are necessarily interoperable. In Bloom was trying to, to address that. Uh, but I think InBloom has sort of two problems. Like one, if you ask 10 different people what InBloom was, uh, you get 10 different answers. And that's, sometimes it was plumbing, sometimes it was a database, sometimes it was architecture, sometimes it was standards. It was, no one sort of had a really clear sense. And that's really um, important in the education space when someone needs a mental frame of reference for what is this new service that we're talking about. And then the second is, um, you know, InBloom was set out to sort of solve an efficiency problem. How do you connect all these different data records together? And the problem is with really sensitive data, whether it's law enforcement, healthcare, or student data, uh, efficiency raises all sorts of privacy concerns. Uh, and so and as privacy concerns, it really sort of, um, it's a Rorschach test, it depends on where you sit politically. If you're center left, you're really concerned about big corporate America having access to your kid's record. If you're center right, 
you think Secretary Duncan has a Bloomberg terminal and can like look up your kids to data. And the problem is, is this that takes on a highly emotional debate and it's not and it takes it out of the realm of policy. Uh, and so I think the big lesson that's come out of Inbloom, and we just got back from, you know, South by Southwest has been sort of the, the benchmark of this for the last three years, because uh, Inbloom was launched there, uh, it folded there, and then this year all the debate, like 13 panels were, what do we learn from it? And I think the issue is that it's, it's privacy by design, that the connected ecosystem that broadband provides and this personalized learning, uh, we want it, we need it for our kids, we need it for the system, we need it for our country, but we need to build in privacy uh, and how do you build trust uh, in that environment. It's more than just being compliant with privacy laws. Uh, it's about sort of really building trust with uh, local parents and with local teachers in terms of how that data is collected, sh uh, stored, and shared, and used uh, in appropriate ways. So. Uh, the, so anyway, that's one big thing. And then the only other big opportunity is that th this notion of connected learning, that uh, we are seeing again a proliferation, uh, an explosion of learning opportunities that are all enabled and connected because of broadband. Uh, the big challenge we have in the education system is how do we recognize and credential that sort of learning? What schools are not, the, the big thing is the broadband plan talked about and was a big part of the E-rate is what happens with bring your own devices, right? What happens when kids start showing up with tablets and with their own smartphones and their own laptops? Uh, the next wave of that is what happens when kids start showing up with their own learning? What happens when a kid has taken a MOOC course uh, over the summer or taught themselves computer co uh, coding? That's all hypothetical in the past. It's very much sort of a real scenario now and schools aren't ready to, to deal with that. Great. Uh, Jim, you've been involved in so many uh, different uh, places. What are your thoughts on overcoming the barriers of the data that we that uh, John was just talking about? But also, talk to us a little bit about the, the issues of job creation, job training, and how does this all apply to that? Because I know that's something you've worked on as well. Yeah, and I do think you know I I, I think data is a, a issue and a, and a challenge and an opportunity. And you know, data is exploding in terms of um, how much is being created. And I think if we use it wisely and use it ethically, we have a challenge to do great things. And, and in the healthcare, the president outlined the uh, Precision Medicine Initiative so we can get the personalized uh, medicine. You know, if you think about it, when you go to get your uh, glasses, uh, you use a prescription, not just a generic pair of glasses. Well, now we can get there in healthcare. The same is true, I think, in education, when we're trying to get to this personalized um, area of education, kind of one-to-one. -one one-to-one um, -one learning. And the, and the same really is true in, in jobs. And first off, I want to say a big kudos to, to Blair, uh, to, to Carrie, to Nick, who's not here, and the rest of the team, because I do think that this national purposes piece is actually the, the most important um, you know, piece of the broadband plan. No offense to the other, piece, the other uh, panels that were here before us, but I think this is, you know, history shows that this is where the things that drive forward. And, and one of those examples is, um, you know, when I was, uh, you know, w when Congress passed this, it was part of the Recovery Act. And they had three primary goals for that Recovery Act, if, if you'll recall. Jobs, jobs, and jobs, right? So when I grabbed a hold of this copy of the, um, the uh, broadband plan, the first thing I did was I turned to look at, okay, what, what are the opportunities for jobs? And, and I know like you, I looked to, footnote 62 in the uh, uh, applications uh, area. And it talked about a guy, uh, Jeffrey Taggart, um, who was a guy in Iowa from, uh, with multiple disabilities. Um, but because of broadband, he was able to get access to a job. He was homebound and couldn't move. Um, and so after I left the, the White House, one of the things I did is I uh, joined together with uh, Julius, who I think was also thinking about how do we leverage this broadband plan to be able to look at the kinds of jobs and opportunities that are, um, that are out there. And we launched something called um, Jobs for America. And when we did so, we went to, you know, we gathered 70 different companies to make uh, specific meaningful um, uh, goals to create 100,000 jobs over a two-year period, which, by the way, we've exceeded with more than 178,000 jobs, many coming back from overseas, from India and Pakistan. But when we went to go launch this, we went to a uh, facility um, in rural Indiana uh, where, thanks to a gigabit fiber connection, they were able to create 5,000 um, jobs. And we went in and we helped lay the uh, one of the bricks um, uh, for this uh, facility that was going to lay the, uh, the, that would help create these jobs, but it was really the broadband plan that really laid the foundation for it because broadband has enabled two dynamic different things. One has changed where we can locate the jobs and the types of jobs that we can do. 
Uh, so t in 2005, Tom Friedman wrote that the world is you know, flat and that fiber was going to take away our jobs and they were going to go overseas, and they did. They went to India and Pakistan. But um, thanks to uh, broadband sweeping across the country, moving into new areas, um, uh, you know, we've been able to um, uh, you know, move these into communi communities now that really need job as fiber has gone farther. But because we've had broadband uh, in the home, it's enabled a new kind of jobs, uh, customer service jobs where people with a headset and a keyboard um, you know, can be the uh, corner receptionist for the entire planet. And they can answer customer service jobs. They can do different types of, of things. And, and it's especially important for people with disabilities, people who are looking for a better work-life balance. Um, and so in looking at this, I was talking with the First Lady's office at one point, and she was talking about um, military spouses and veterans, right? Veterans who have a high um, a number of uh, disabilities and uh, spouses who often move um, uh, from place to place uh, and thus can't keep a job. A broadband connected job turns out to be the next big thing and so we also moved into that area um, and created, uh, you know, 15,000 jobs in those areas. So I think, you know, to me one of the impacts of the National Broadband Plan has been, you know, having impacts in jobs in a number of different ways and I'd like to come back to if we have time, I think how we move this from the sectors that have uh, largely benefited from the internet into the other um, pieces and, and get to some of the issues I think uh, Jason talked about, which is how do we drive this 1% productivity growth. Yeah. Well, let's, let's talk about that. That'll be my second question for you. I'll be, but, but, but the first question for everybody, um, I want to focus on this question of capacity building uh, because I think that's something that we didn't uh, uh, t to do terribly well, and I think, um, but the, the world has moved on. From the vantage point in terms of what you see, uh, and you're all interacting with various parts, particularly in the federal government, but it's, this is really true for governments at all level, and I invite you to talk about governments at all level. What do they need to do to build capacity to take advantage of the new opportunities that data and broadband create to improve how they deliver their public services? Carrie, let me start with you. Sure. So, you know, when we thought about capacity for the healthcare section of the plan, one of the key questions was how much is enough? you know, for hospitals to do their business of telemedicine. And then as we think about how healthcare is transforming and care is moving outside of facilities, but to, you know, where you live, work, and play, especially getting home-based care, you know, what, what does that really take? Um, you know, we look at the healthcare system of the future is going to have to be connected, interoperable, and trusted. So all those endpoints are linked. The interoperability piece is the system sharing and exchanging information to be used for some purpose. And the trust component's really important because as we have all these connected technologies, people have to have confidence that this is gonna work as expected. So, you know, from a pure infrastructure question, that really only comes up when you're talking to sort of the, the facilities or IT folks in the healthcare system. You know, people are more concerned as, does my telemedicine network work properly, um, but they didn't, didn't really look at it from an infrastructure uh, building but perspective not, not when I talk about the system. in terms of infrastructure, mm -hmm. but also in terms of talent. Mm -hmm. Oh. Because the IT engineers haven't been there and that kind of stuff. Right. So. No, and we definitely are seeing uh, workforce change needed, um, especially on the wireless front within hospitals. So wireless is a, a huge headache for how do you configure and manage a network um, to make sure that it's always uh, reliable and performing as you expect. Um, expect. Performing as expected is key for healthcare. And um, you think about the challenges like in education, bring your own device. So you have medical devices <coughs> that are having to transmit patient data. You have a workflow that has to be done wirelessly and you have folks bringing in their laptops and smartphones. You know, who's going to make sure that you've managed that infrastructure? And then you think about all the data that's generated. Um, it's a blessing and a curse. So we have clinicians absolutely Absolutely overwhelmed with lots of new inputs, but how do they filter through the ones that are most important, most clinically relevant at the right time to make a care decision? And you know, we're going to create, I think, some upheaval when we think about medical malpractice and tort reform because we're starting to see an instance of what is your liability for perhaps missing information that was available to you but not consumed and acted upon. So. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Is good <laughs> it's a trigger, trigger, or is that just going to like destroy the whole thing? No, no, nothing's going to destroy the whole thing. I hope, mm -hmm. but um, but it, it's you know it's going to be a real challenge that we have to 
address. And I think it almost comes down to um, just a cultural belief. And you know, are you the kind of person or company that buys into a wellness, com uh, you know, wellness program or not? Yeah. You know, do you think something's for the the better good or not? Well, but it's a classic example of how technology can. Um, drive good behavior if you're punishing bad behavior, but can do the reverse. In other words, if people have access to information but haven't yet figured out how to use it, but they're on the cutting edge, mm -hmm. but then they get sued because they didn't use it enough when they had access to it, that's, that's right. Where, kind of, where's the incentive? And right. then we also, I don't, you know, there's, I guess, conflicting research and evidence around some of the incentives in healthcare that talk about um, un unfavorable provider practices in terms of you know, sharing information, you know, because you, you don't want to lose your patients, so you worry about competition there, and practices on the vendor part where they may not have necessarily the incentives to help you help your data flow. So these are things that, you know, are top of mind for the government right now. John, what about for you, capacity building? Where do you think, what, for education? Yeah, so I think, I, I think of the capacity building in sort of two different ways. I mean, one is just the technical capacity building that, you know, uh, schools wrestle with how to deploy this technology in a, in a reliable way. And that's, that's the beginning of trust, right? That for most of us, if the network goes down, that's an annoyance. Uh, but if you're a teacher, when the class starts, you have a countdown timer, just like the one in the back there that's checking down you know, 45 minutes or 50 minutes. You don't have the luxury, if, if you're basing everything off of a connected learning resource, uh, if that's not reliable and up all the time, um, you, you you stop relying on it if it's if it if it breaks. And so, you know, part of gaining teacher trust and practitioner trust is having that sort of technical capability at the local level. I think one of the great um, advances that were made in the E-rate modernization was sort of allowing for managed Wi-Fi and managed broadband in a way that uh, sort of takes some of this responsibility off of districts. It's going to be great. But then the other big capacity challenge we have is that once you get that technical problem solved is the, is the model capacity. Uh, a big part of, like, I, th I think part of what Jason was talking about and, and why we've seen uh, so low productivity in education is that we automate a lot of the old way that we do education. Uh, so instead of redesigning the process around what a broadband-enabled uh, learning system might look like. And that, that, that's different capacity building, right? That's not just technical. It's not just getting the wires connected and the technology working. It's redesigning what that learning experience looks like as a result of having broadband and connected learning resources. We're seeing uh, examples of that with blended learning, with the flipped classroom. Flipped classrooms are sort of ingenious, right? Uh, you have the kids watch the lectures at home uh, and then uh, instead of doing homework and then when they come into class it's 45 minutes of uh, interactive class discussion or more one-on-one -on -one groups. Makes more efficient use of class time and frankly of the teacher time uh, and a great use of sort of broadband. Very simple thing but it's a completely redesign of the way that you do in the instructional model. And so we need a lot more capacity building there too. Uh, and then at the state level and, and even at the federal level we need to think about what does a, a connected learning system look like and how does that change a lot of the ways that we do other sort of government mechanisms. So accountability right now and uh, assessments that one of the, the key things driving a lot of broadband adoption for better or for, or for worse is you have all these sort of new assessments coming out and you can do assessments differently than you could with the old paper uh, bubble you know tests right you can do simulations you could do more sort of rich asking students questions and getting short-term uh, short responses uh, all that requires sort of connectivity in a way that we've not had before and so hopefully the e-rate is going to help sort of drive that and uh, give us a little bit better sort of government service there Sure. And I think in you know talent and capacity, I, I think this is one of our biggest issues we've got to confront. We we certainly we have a massive STEM education challenge across the country. High tech companies who are driving much of this economy can't hire the people they need to be able to do these things. In the big data area alone, uh, there's an estimated 144,000 data scientists that were short um, to be able to take advantage of all of this data um, to make use and to sort through uh, you know to find the needle in the haystack of um, of data in cybersecurity area, there's essentially a zero percent unemployment rate. We can't hire enough people uh, to get going, and this is why I think one of the, you know, getting back to the national broadband plans, one of the most important things that it did again was focus on the E-rate, and I think Blair was a huge champion in moving this across the the finish line, um, you know. But but here we've got 40 million kids who don't have the speeds they need to learn, and if you think about it. Today, about 50% of all jobs require some type of high-tech skills. By the end of the decade, it's about 77%. And we've got kids, and it reminds me of this one kid from uh, Albuquerque, New Mexico, who wrote to Saul Khan, who makes these educational videos. Um, and this kid says, 
Saul, you got to come visit our school. Uh, you know, we, we, we love your videos, but our crappy internet, or excuse me, our sucky internet <laughs> um, uh, connection isn't fast enough for us to do that. We need you to come in person uh, uh, to, come, to come speak. And, um, you know, one, upon reading this kid's uh, letter, I realized that it wasn't Saul Khan's math videos that he needed, it was English. Um, <laughs> but but it, well, what is the technical difference between crappy and sucky? Is that like two megabits? <laughs> well, well, no, let me tell you. So, so I talked to a CIO in Maryland, right? So sucky internet, when, I, when he talked about the kind of broadband transformation that he was doing yeah. his thing, he compared it to trying to suck peanut butter through a... Um, oh, suck, that's sucky, okay. Yeah, that's suck, that's uh, that's suck peanut butter through a straw. That's sucky. And when you think about the difference between a dial-up connection, which is what a lot of these kids have today, is the equivalent speed. Really the definition of crappy, by the way. It, yeah, no, no, no. <laughs> right, then it just yeah. flows. Yeah, right. right. Um, uh, but the difference between a uh, straw and peanut butter and a fiber connection mm -hmm. um, is that you really get this fire hose of data from which you can learn. And that's, that's really the difference, and that's why this E-rate upgrade to both provide uh, gigabit fiber to every school and Wi-Fi to every classroom, I, help, I think helps overcome the sucky challenge. No. Well, so now I'm going to ask each a question. By the way, if there are questions, I'm going to ask another question of the round, but if there are questions, please, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll get you in a second. Um, uh, this is a way, Jim, that you get to, I'm going to let you go first and answer your own question about new sectors, but I'm going to frame the question this way. The presidential transition team um, of both parties, come, or, or whatever party won, actually, comes to you in January 17 and says, we're going to, uh, we want you to write a new chapter in the next broadband ecosystem plan, what, what, what is your chapter and what is it recommending? Uh, harnessing the enormous opportunity on the horizon would be the title of my chapter. And actually, I think, you know, and it's a great question because every campaign is about uh, a choice between the past and the future, and I would think that hopefully people are talking about this before um, you get to a transition. Um, but. Um, but to me, when I think about it, I, and, I, and, and again, this is why I think this chapter is one of the most important things, is because the applications have always driven opportunity, and that's been what's fueled um, uh, American life. And, and I was fortunate before I worked in the uh, Clinton White House, I worked in the Senate, and I happened to ha work with this uh, great forward-looking senator um, who really taught me about the power of the app. And, um, um, you know, 1991, you know, this is five years after we had, um, uh, put together a piece of legislation to connect five uh, supercomputing centers together with really high speed connections. We're talking 56 kilobit speed connection. Um, and that created NSFnet, um, mm -hmm. and soon overnight all these universities uh, jumped on board. And so by 1991 we needed to solve two problems. Um, and we created a piece of legislation called the High Performance Computing and Communications Act. Um, one, we had a data challenge. Uh, we had text, we had uh, video, uh, uh, images, uh, and sound that couldn't even be used in the same software package. So we asked NSF to help solve this problem. They gave a grant to a little young guy at one of these supercomputing centers called Mark Andreessen, and in came the Mosaic browser. That was a huge boon to the internet, and it drove uh, enormous uptake. The second thing that we solved, um, or we tried to solve in Congress, but we couldn't, was making, moving this beyond just uh, a research and education network. And while we couldn't convince uh, Congress, NSF was easier to convince, and they uh, did something uh, which they called creating .com, which was uh, removing the commercial barrier and expanding it to the rest of uh, the economy. Um, and in the last 15 years, we've seen as much economic growth from the internet as the industrial age created in 50 years. Phenomenal um, growth engine. But now we're at a, you know, in wave after wave of innovation, but now we're at a really exceptional point. And I, I think, you know, what happened in that first phase is we got to, uh, we boosted uh, productivity growth, as Jason mentioned, by about 1%, um, which 1% sounds small. Um, but it had enormous uh, growth impacts in the economy, creating 20 million jobs, all these great things. But now we've got this convergence of uh, connectivity, um, of cloud computing, which is enabling um, uh, 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 infinite computing and ambient intelligence. Um, we've got this uh, explosion in connected devices, and that's fueling new kinds of data. And if you think about uh, where we are on the Internet, the Internet has already transformed about 20% of the economy. Um, it's the financial sector, it's, about, it's the uh, entertainment sector. Those are all largely digital um, sectors of the day. That's a pretty phenomenal thing. 
Um, but it's, think about this other 80%. That's the physical world. That's manufacturing. That's transportation, um, uh, agriculture. And when we can help bring that internet transfer, uh, transformation to these other sectors of the economy, we can achieve uh, enormous things. So you think about UPS. UPS has a whole bunch of sensors on their trucks, um, you know, on the engine, um, and they're communicating constantly, tracking packages, all this. And when they can save just one minute out of every truck every day, and you add that all up, that adds up to $14 million uh, of savings for them. When you add that up to every company in that sector and every sector in the economy, um, uh, Jeff Immelt, who's the chairman of General Electric, uh, goes through the economy, adds that up, and he says, you know what, that gives us back that 1% productivity growth. And, and what does that mean? He says, by 2030, that's like adding $15 trillion to the economy. That's like adding an entire another U.S. economy to the global economy. And when Jason was talking about it, he mentioned a number of, if we had kept on that rate of that 1% productivity growth, that that would have meant $45,000 for every American. This extra 1% growth could mean about $30,000 for every American in terms of raised standards of living. That is phenomenal. But the challenge is in this 80% of the economy, only 1% of the things that can be connected have been connected. And this is where this internet things revolution is really taking off as the smart revolution moves from the palm of our hands to our smart watches, our smart cars, our smart homes, our smart cities. Um, our smart everything. Um, we're seeing enormous things, and we're seeing agencies really take advantage of this in really dynamic ways. At DOT, first off, like you take a look at transportation, a Ford hybrid creates about 25 gigabytes per data um, per hour. That's phenomenal. 10 million lines of code, phenomenal. DOT looks at this, and they say, wow, if we can harness all this information and connect these vehicles and vehicle to vehicle communications, we can save half of all fatalities. That's 50%. That's as much as the seatbelt saved um, over time. We look at um, agriculture. Smarter um, uh, sensors can help us um, uh, you know, produce for more food to f uh, feed more mouths in a more nutritious and environmentally conscious way. GSA is looking at buildings, one of the largest uh, energy consumers in our economy. Um, by using these smarter sensors deployed, connected sensors deployed throughout the building. 15% energy savings throughout all, all federal buildings. Throughout the entire economy, people are making moves to take advantage of this connectivity uh, and all this. But as we make this uh, smart revolution from you know, our smartphones to smart everything, I think we really need smart policies to go with it and a, and a more concerted effort even beyond this chapter of the National Broadband Plan to focus attention on achieving these bigger goals so that we can achieve this 1% productivity gain. John, what's your chapter? My chapter? Yeah. We're like healthcare. Um, no. <laughs> I, but I actually, but I, I do think like I, two, two things strike me in terms of my chapter. Uh, first is um, you know supporting, and that that could be through funding, but it doesn't necessarily need to always be through funding. Uh, the demand side of this. So how do you again create the the sort of broadband demand uh, with these new models? And that's um, you, you've seen a little bit of the, the department sort of toying with that a bit with uh, some race to the top grants for districts as well as uh, the investing in innovation fund, but. There, there, we need to figure out how to get schools not just to automate the old way of doing things, but again, creating these sort of new instructional models and these new school models. Uh, sometimes that requires funding, but when the president announced uh, the E-rate funding, he, he did the, or the E-rate uh, reforms, he did this at Mooresville in North Carolina. Uh, which is an amazing school, but the, what's amazing about them is that they're the third poorest school uh, in the state of North Carolina. 75% of school districts across the country get more per pupil dollars than they had to spend. And yet they were able to do online curriculum, online textbooks, uh, online connectivity for kids, uh, new tools for teachers, all within their existing budget. Uh, because again, they thought differently about the way you organize school uh, and you organize your budgets in order to take advantage of the broadband. We need to figure out how to do that because I think sometimes what happens is we connect to school and connect to classroom and think that naturally some sort of reform will happen from it. And so we can very, um, uh, we can close the digital divide in some extenses, but still see a lot of the achievement divides uh, that we see in, uh, across different types of student uh, demographics.
demographic groups. And so, again, focusing on the um, on, on those new models that create sort of the demand for broadband. And then second, uh, you know, I think there's huge opportunities there in terms of mobile. And th this is one area where the E-rate reform sort of stopped short, and there's good reasons for that in terms of uh, program demand and whatnot. But, you know, all the different types of learning experiences that we're talking, uh, that kids are having today, happen largely in a classroom, but increasingly are happening outside of the classroom. They're happening at home, it's happening wherever the kid has a connected device. Uh, and so th this is gonna challenge, I think, a lot of our, our uh, programs in terms of not just supporting the institution of school, but the mobility that it comes with um, uh, with mobile learning that uh, it happens when a kid has a, a connected broadband device that is wireless or they're connecting in different parts of the uh, in their their community and so thinking about that differently uh, and supporting that and getting uh, rid of some of the legacy regulations not just an e-rate but a lot of other areas that kind of hold back this model of learning um, is going to be vital Another example of the regulations, this gets back to Jason too, we have regulations that sort of force education not to be productive, right? So we have class size regulations, we have all sorts of things that sort of force a certain number of kids per certain number of teachers. And that is a, an attempt to try to regulate on quality, but it totally ignores what's possible in a connected classroom with the types of technology and the personalized learning that, uh, that happens now. Uh, there's one school in Arizona that has uh, 60 kids per teacher. Uh, and it sounds horrific, except for the fact that that one teacher is always working with five to 10 kids that always need their most uh, attention. And so kids are actually getting more individualized student attention with teachers, not less, but that doesn't show up in the macro statistics. We need to let that sort of productivity revolution happen in education. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why, again, looking at healthcare, I think the Meaningful Use Program, uh, there are lots of challenges with it, obviously. The, the genius of it was that it wasn't just the adoption of a record, it was the use of the record. And I think that's the new thing that, again, we have to get teachers to think about is not just having broadband, not just having a grade book, not just having an online textbook, but how do we incentivize that use in different uses that, again, feed the different models, instruction, school, to district, uh, to state. And so thinking about the, that side. Carrie, okay. your chapter. Sure. Well, I really love Jim's <coughs> chapter, so I'm going to plagiarize most of that. Um, so I was thinking about the titles for healthcare. Is it healthcare's moonshot or healthcare? Let's catch up mm -hmm. in the sense that it's lagging every other industry. So I think I settle on, you know, how do we re-engineer healthcare delivery? And I'm going to steal from Jim Champy with, you know, people, process, and technology. So we have to take people and redefine who's doing what. We have a lot of clinicians who are not being allowed to practice, you know, at the top of their license. And let's face it, as our kids, we've got we're dealing with kids and elderly parents, you know, we're the caregiver more and more. There are a lot of things that we are doing for our own families, and we need to really empower and support ourselves as caregivers. Uh, the processes, I, I think John is spot on with, you know, as you think about education, you don't just want to automate a process. You know, we see that in healthcare. If you just take a paper process, a bad process, and automate it, then you're just doing a bad process faster. You know, that's not what we need. We need to do it better. And then the technology, let's put to work all this new, you know, a high-speed processing, the computer, the high, you know, um, big analytics, you know, big data, leveraging analytics so that we can actually move towards that precision or personalized medicine so that we are actually optimizing healthcare at an individual level for every citizen of our country. I think that would be pretty powerful so that we can actually introduce more science into the uh, art of medicine. Great. There was a question. Yeah, um, Jennifer Holtz with NTIA. So, um, <laughs> Hi, Jennifer Holtz with NTIA. So the plan was initially written with different verticals, one on healthcare, one on education, one on public safety. And I think as we've seen a lot of that progress and we're hearing now about the convergence of connections, how do we make a more comprehensive approach a reality? How do we work across the federal government and with communities to not have these separate programs that are siloed? And how do we look at this much more holistically? I mean, wanna... oh, I, I'm... I'll jump on that. The, uh, you know, you know, one is um, you've got a great leader in Larry Strickling, uh, who has played a really important role within uh, the White House and within the administration for you know pulling things together. But I do think if I had one, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, Blair has done a fabulous job. But I think this is something that the White House also needs to own. They need to own an innovation strategy 
that helps drive this. There's certainly a lot of verticals. You know, if we look at just at, at uh, drone policy, right, and, and there's a lot of technology, I think, being inhibited just within the FAA on drones, right, and technology. It's a wonderful area. But that's because it's specific vertical uh, regulations within there. And, and there's some things you can't bridge. It's just you, you got to deal with it. But, I mean, I think you've got to be able to have a top-down vision for doing this. You know, one of the things we, we did the day after the uh, – uh, Blair issued the report in the White House as we pulled together every single agency that uh, Blair listed in the National Purposes Challenges, and we began a process through the National Science and Technology <coughs> Council to be able to try to map the um, some of the verticals and try to, to try to do that. But I think we need to do it in a in a more deliberate and um, and purposeful way. I think the the president has begun to do this in key areas. Um, by uh, launching a big data initiative, by launching a precision medicine uh, initiative, by launching ConnectEd uh, initiative uh, in education, um, and in launching, um, you know, in manufacturing, the advanced manufacturing initiative, the national robotics initiative. I mean, he's taking on a lot of these pieces, um, and I think there's some pieces that are helping linking it, but I do think that it takes continued leadership because this is the area where we can drive enormous economic gains throughout it, uh, throughout the economy. Yeah, I agree with that. And I would just add on, I mean, I would never want to be the program management officer for this because you think about all the different verticals you have in the society, right? And then all the horizontal pieces. So let's get the folks who are working on security for each of these in the same room, privacy for each of these in the same room, et cetera, et cetera. So there's an opportunity for more coordination around best practices and lessons learned, but just the feasibility of getting the work done, I think, you know, as we saw in the plan, you had to break it into chunks. You know, that's why our government's organized into the departments it is, uh, because it's got to make the work manageable. But I agree, how do we get more cross-pollination? Great. Um, Larry is calling the clock. I'll simply say, well, one of the things that I would, uh, if I had to do it over again, I think the plan should have been written under the, um, uh, within the White House, either Domestic Policy Council, NTAA, whatever. Um, uh, in part because the things that the FCC were doing, it'd be pretty easy um, not to talk about what was happening yesterday up on Capitol Hill. It's fairly easy if the White House says, hey, maybe you should think about doing this on Spectrum and USF, that the, the FCC might well take their advice. Um, but what we, part of the purpose of the plan is not just to have the best ideas, but to build political capital for those ideas. And I think that's easier to do if it's clearly coming from the White House. Uh, and I think particularly uh, with, with the next one being the importance of things like adoption and national purposes, uh, it's really important that it, that it have that uh, high level leadership. So we're going to take a 10 minute break. We will be back here at three o'clock. The uh, aforementioned Larry Strickling will uh, provide some, um, some of his thoughts. We'll have a quick panel on the agenda ahead, which I certainly hope all of you should participate in because in some sense it really is it, it's to have everybody have an opportunity to answer the same question. If you're given an opportunity to write a chapter in the plan, what do you write? Um, so please join me in thanking this panel.